residential library. Now, we spent some time here, I think maybe a, a couple of weeks ago, talking a little bit about George Washington, uh, and I showed you some of the books in the, in the big reading room out there. And now we've got a special opportunity to explore uh, the rare books suite, the rare books and manuscripts suite. This is the John and Adrian Mars rare book and manu manuscript suite that we're in. And I'm starting our conversation in front of an iconic portrait of the great man himself, George Washington, by Rembrandt Peel. Now, you'll remember from our earlier conversations that the Peel family were great painters of George Washington. His earliest portrait done in 1772 was by Charles Wilson Peel, who is the father of Rembrandt Peel. And Rembrandt Peel knew George Washington in life and sketched him in life. But this painting was actually done in the 1850s. It's the so-called porthole portrait of George Washington. And, and Rembrandt Peel himself was trying to make the perfect likeness of the man. That's what he described it as. And he studied the Udon bust, and he studied his father's paintings, and he had his own sketches from life as well. And, and he created this portal portrait. He, he, he created, a, I don't know, a number of them, you know, about 20 or so portraits like this over the course of his life. And, and also big, large scale portraits that are beautiful Rembrandt Peel portrait of George Washington at the Battle of Princeton, which shows poor General Mercer getting bayoneted to death in the foreground, and Washington's kind of pointing off in the distance. It's a great leadership portrait, and now is hanging, actually, uh, in the National Gallery uh, down in, uh, in D.C. It was at the Cochrane for many, many years. And if you go on and Google up the uh, um, uh, Rembrandt Peel, George Washington at Princeton portrait, you'll see that. And you can see that the head of George Washington in that portrait is essentially the one you're going to get here in the porthole portrait of George Washington. Now it's called the porthole portrait for obvious reasons. Uh, the, the shape of the, uh, the the painted in frame that you'll see. This is a painting that you often see in American iconography of paintings because one is hanging in the Oval Office. In fact, it, it hung there during the Obama administration. It's also there during the Trump administration. Each president in the White House hangs a Washington portrait in the in the Oval Office. Uh, and I don't know when the Rembrandt Peel um, uh, got in there, uh, if it was Obama or if it was there before during the Bush presidency. That's a good trivia question for Thursday night that I won't get correct. But uh, but this one uh, is there now, the portal portrait. So you often see the president in front of the portal portrait. But the thing that's great about the one we own here at Mount Vernon is that it has the original frame that was designed by Peel for this portrait, and it's rich with the symbolism of Republican iconography, small r, Republicanism, which defines what American liberty and notions uh, of Republicanism are about. So you can, you can see the beautiful gilded wood frame here, uh, which frames this portrait. So first off, it's, it's, it's George Washington looking his best. I kind of call this the soap opera portrait of George Washington. You know, it's the, uh, it's the beautiful man in this case, uh, a little bit romanticized by, the, this is a 19th century portrait but done in the 1850s. This one, uh, the frame, uh, as you'll see, the main bulk of the frame are these uh, fasces, right? So the bundle of sticks, wrapped sticks, which represents civil authority going back to the Roman Republic. Uh, and so uh, civil and sovereign power sticks, very common iconography in, in early Republican and early federal design. You'll see it in Frames, of course, you'll see it in um, in uh, door surrounds, in molding. You'll see it in uh, in, in all sorts of uh, different uh, you know chairs, uh, iconography of the early republic. And then, of course, you also have the the oak leaves and acorns. The oak leaves and acorns represent ancient virtue, right? Virtu, which is the the notion that. Uh, public servants are at their best when they're serving the common good rather than their own private interests. That's the virtuous man. That's the, really the ideal that George Washington held up for himself and a lot of the early leadership of the, of the founding era. That was the ideal that they were striving to project. Now, obviously, there was plenty of corruption and venality and horrible behavior in the founding. Uh, but in that sense, it, it, it is a symbolic representation of what they expected their public servants to be about. Now, this doesn't always remain the case. I mean, in the 19th century, you know, when democracy is really in, in its full uh, flourish, the idea that representatives are competitive fighting over the interest of their representatives uh, or, or their districts, you know, that's more an acceptable ideal of what a good politician is supposed to do. They're supposed to deliver for their constituents. In Washington's era, it's, that's, that's verboten. You're not there to represent 
your constituents, you're, you're there as the wisest man from that community to do the right thing for the common good. It's a very different ideal about what representational government means, and it's embedded into the iconography of this frame because George Washington was the ultimate virtuous citizen, the man who stood above it all, always served the common good, and always represented that idea of self-interested or, or self-disinterestedness, uh, virtuousness. Okay, and then also, of course, it's crowned with the laurel wreath representing heroic uh, glory in this case. George Washington is the great symbol of the American Revolutionary War. He's depicted here in his military uniform. So even though it's painted in the 1850s, they're depicting George Washington as the military figure in this portal portrait. Peel has other portraits where Washington is in civilian clothes. And this one, I think, crowned with laurels of glory, George Washington. It's an incredible portrait when you think of the, all the symbolism embedded into it and the work that Peel did. One final note on the Peels, um, they painted George Washington a lot. He was a very uh, important part of their own uh, business making enterprise. You know, portraits of George Washington were popular. They were able, able to produce them. In fact, Gilbert Stewart complained about the Peels when he heard about the, this one of the sittings that uh, Charles Wilson Peel orchestrated to have not only Charles Wilson Peel there, Rembrandt Peel, Peel um, uh, Titian Peel, because Charles Wilson Peel named all his sons after great painters and they became painters. Um, Rembrandt Peel, Titian Peel, James Peel uh, were all there and, um, and painting George Washington and sketching him from life. And famously, Gilbert Stewart said, well, if George Washington is not careful, he'll be peeled entirely. That's a pun. See, that's funny. That's good. I'm getting no audience response from Matt or anybody. So hopefully you're laughing along at home with that. Okay, so we're here to actually look at some of the great stuff we keep in these rooms. This is the reading room that we're in and you'll get a sense of it as I walk around. If you were here to do research in the in, in, at Mount Vernon, this is the rare books and manuscripts room. So let me come around here uh, where you would be looking at some of our incredible collections under the watchful eye of librarian if you're working here in this room. Uh, now, one of the great collections we have in Mount Vernon is the archives of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association themselves. This is an archive which goes back to be really before the 1850s when the Ladies Association first organized uh, to save Mount Vernon, to save George Washington's home and make it available for people. And as you know, and as I've, I've talked to you earlier, this is the 160th year that we've been uh, under operation, open for guests. So it's really a remarkable story. And it's incredible continuity, an archive of women's leadership, which goes back to the 1850s. It's incredibly rare in that sense. And it's an ongoing living archive. That is to say, we're generating new materials for it all the time. Now, we distinguish operationally here between our historic archives, which are organized and kept in the library, and our operational archives, which are in a period of transitioning into historical archives over time. Uh, and so that, that is uh, an exciting project. And really, this building, as you'll remember, was created in 2013. And so it was the presidential library for George Washington. And one of the first projects that we really started working on was getting the archives of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association in better uh, organizational control, digitizing a lot of it. And that's an ongoing project that we're still working on. And so I just wanted to bring out a representative example of some of the incredible things that you can find in that archive. And in this case, I decided I wanted to connect it with uh, one of the, the first ladies, uh, Linda Bird Johnson and her relationship with Mount Vernon. and also speaks to the leadership of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association uh, in historic preservation and conservation. And right here I have uh, laid out for us a couple things. One is a picture of Lady Bird Johnson at Mount Vernon from May of uh, 1965. And one is a letter that she wrote uh, to Eunice Holderness, who was the vice regent for Missouri uh, and Tennessee from March 19th, uh, 1965. Now in the 60s, the Mount Vernon Ladies Association had been working to preserve the view shed across the river. And they'd been, uh, had great letter writing campaigns all over the country to make sure that the view remained pristine and not covered with development, which was obviously growing, the suburbs are growing rapidly in the post-World War II years, and particularly the pressure on, on the outskirts of DC 
uh, made it so that the view across the river from George Washington's home was in great danger. Now here, in this case, Lady Bird Johnson is writing to Mrs. Holderness in which she thanks, uh, thanks the Ladies Association for their work. And let me just quote a, a little bit about this. Our nation has been blessed with a rich scenic heritage and as our civilization grows, it is up to all of us to have the wisdom to preserve nature's corners of beauty and channel our growth in ways that enhance and do not diminish our natural surroundings. I think that's the whole notion of, of why smart growth, the idea of conservation and preservation are actually quite interwoven, uh, that the, the natural landscape is a powerful cultural um, resource for all of us to share. And so when we can, as, as a community, as a state, as a nation, when we can agree that there are certain aspects of our natural surroundings that need to be protected and preserved, uh, we need to be careful that we develop in that way. And obviously, President Johnson uh, had a, a major program of conserving the environment and was early in the environmental movement. And the Mount Vernon Ladies Association were seen as themselves uh, real pioneers in this work. In fact, the viewshed is preserved and was preserved early on as a combination of agreements and partnerships, private and public, between both local authorities, state authorities, national authorities, and then private landowners themselves. In fact, the conservation easement uh, is one way that they preserve that view in which a private landowner would agree uh, not to destroy trees and not to destroy, not to build beyond a certain level in order to preserve the viewshed. In addition to a national park, uh, the Piscataway National Park, which was created by the American people to help preserve the view in the early 1960s. So this is a letter that's um, in our archives from the First Lady uh, to the Ladies Association expressing uh, her support for their, um, their leadership. The other thing Lady Bird Johnson loved about Mount Vernon was the gardens. And we've seen some of the glorious gardens this time of year in particular, they're at another peak actually. The peonies are blooming and smelling gorgeous right now. And here's a, a, a picture of her visiting Mount Vernon in May of, of, uh, of 1965, in which she delivers a bouquet of magnolia flowers to the Ladies Association. Uh, she also appeared uh, on a show uh, with uh, uh, on ABC News from 1966, uh, in which she received actually a, um, a Peabody Emmy, a uh, George Foster Peabody Emmy Award for the program, and that was her visit to uh, a, a visit to Washington with Mrs. Lyndon B. Johnson on behalf of a more beautiful America. So celebrating this notion of conservation and beauty in the gardens of Mount Vernon, uh, won an Emmy Award for the First Lady. Uh, here's a trivia piece for you. How many other presidents or First Ladies won Emmy Awards? I'll let you mull on that while we, we float over to see some of the other great things we have in the uh, in the archives here. Any questions yet, Matt, about the, the Ladies Association archives? We'll get into the historical collection. People would like to know, uh, how does one is it possible to tour the library? Yes, yeah, so touring the library during our closure period obviously is impossible. And we are still the great the state of Mount Vernon is closed and, and the library is closed. And uh, it's not at all clear when we'll be able to provide tours again of these incredible spaces. Uh, we also, uh, and, and to do that, you typically would just write an email uh, to the library and we would try to work out a schedule that works for everybody. Uh, it isn't part of the normal ticketing process of Mount Vernon. And so we tend to do those tours more on an ad hoc basis. There has been in the past some paid uh, VIP tours of the building. We do have open houses of the library uh, during the free day, uh, George Washington's birthday. And so who knows when we'll be able to tour again. I think it's going to be a long time because obviously uh, we want to do our part to keep the uh, chances of community spread of the COVID virus down. And, uh, and having folks in these enclosed spaces is not really the best way to do that. So, so uh, in normal times, uh, you also could do research here. If you had a legitimate research agenda uh, that was approved by our research staff here in the library, you could come and work in some of our archives. So if you were writing a project, it could be just for a high school paper. I mean, as long as it's a legitimate research project that we feel is not just you wanting to have some fun, uh, and, that, and there's a reason for you to get access to the actual documents, uh, we can make those available. But of course, we're also digitizing a lot of our materials here, and you can go online and explore some of the archives. I know that Matt will drop the link uh, into this live feed 
But essentially, you go on the Washington Library webpage and look at our digital collections here at the Washington Library. Okay, so let's move on to uh, one of our earliest items that we have, and really one of the most powerful, I think, uh, somewhat symbolic, uh, more than uh, research potential in it. But what it is is the commission of, uh, of Lawrence Washington in the British Army, a King's Royal Commission to Lawrence, um, which he received on June 9th, 1740. And it's a commission of, of Lawrence Washington as a captain in the provincial forces uh, serving under Admiral Edward Vernon in the Cartagena campaign, 1740. So you all, of course, great um, uh, students of history know about the War of Jenkins' Ear, don't you? The War of Jenkins' Ear. So Jenkins was a um, lieutenant of a British naval vessel, which had, had he would had his ear cut off by the Spanish in the Caribbean, actually years before the war broke out. Um, but the British, uh, there were some British interests in Parliament who really wanted to go to the war with the Spanish. They actually thought uh, taking over the Spanish main was a potential growth area for the British Empire and, and humbling the Spanish in that area. Uh, and they hadn't been to war in a, in a long time. The Walpole administration actually had, had, had kept the peace as it was important for uh, British trade. Uh, but at any rate, uh, poor Jenkins' ear gets waved around the bloody ear in Parliament and, uh, and, and creates a momentum for this war. Now, this war is interesting from the perspective of the colonial period in America because it's really the first time the colonies are asked um, to participate in a in expeditionary forces that the British are putting together. There's one created that goes on to attack Fort Lewisburg in Nova Scotia uh, in New England. And then there's one created in the Southern colonies uh, of which Lawrence gets a commission that goes to attack um, the, the Spanish Maine. And in this case, under uh, uh, Admiral Edward Vernon. And of course, Lawrence himself who gains this commission, uh, it becomes a Royal officer goes as part of this expeditionary provincial troop of largely Virginians, but also some others as well. Uh, and they never really see uh, active duty. A lot of them are stay on the ship, and many of them get sick and, and die, in fact, uh, from yellow fever, from malaria, from other diseases. And the fiasco of uh, the Cartagena campaign uh, is, in fact, a great a defeat for the British. But nevertheless, uh, this impact had a, had a huge uh, influence on, on Lawrence Washington's own understanding of himself, of the British Empire, and also therefore on uh, his uh, young stepbrother, George Washington, who was corresponding with Lawrence while this was happening. Uh, and also uh, Lawrence, of course, had that royal commission that George Washington would never get, even though Washington would sort of step into his footsteps in the military line here in the colony of Virginia at the time. And also it gives Mount Vernon its name, uh, this famous name that we associate with America and American identity going back to George Washington was actually the name of a British admiral, uh, a British uh, admiral who lost a battle. And so Mount Vernon had been known as Little Hunting Creek Plantation before that. Uh, and Lawrence Washington named it after Ed Edward Vernon. But this is an incredible commission because you have the King's seal here still on the document. It's a beautiful document. Uh, and of great historic significance. And Doug, we have some good guests that want to know, like, uh, how, do you, how do we acquire documents like this? Right, so good question. So how do we build our collection here at Mount Vernon? So the Ladies Association acquired Mount Vernon in 1858. Uh, they really took possession and made it open to the public by 1860 after doing some work on it. But there was nothing here. They didn't get anything with the house other than a few important items, very important items, the key to the Bastille, the Udall bust of George Washington, some fire buckets that George Washington had, as well as a few other items. Uh, and, and so everything you're going to see in this library, everything you see when you visit the museum or the mansion here at Mount Vernon was acquired since then. And it was acquired in a lot of different ways, oftentimes by gift gift of people who had inherited it, oftentimes by sale, where it would be a private sale between the owner and the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Uh, and so the library collection really starts being developed around the turn of the century when the first books of George Washington start to come back to Mount Vernon at the turn of the last century, 2000, you know, the 20th century. Um, and, and so uh, it, it, the library here has existed 
uh, you know, and grown basically in the early 20th century. Mount Vernon established a library in the 1920s, which had some of George Washington's books, but then other books that were going to be helpful to staff to do research here. And that um, private home library sort of grew over time, really from the 1920s until uh, until uh, the early um, the early 21st century. Uh, when the move to start creating this presidential library began in earnest around 2007, 2008. Uh, and so what do we do to acquire things? Well, so we have uh, some monies and an endowment that we can draw on. And we, we acquire manuscripts related to George Washington's era as a first priority, particularly George Washington and Martha Washington letters. Also books that he owned, or if not the actual book he owned, then duplicate editions, which I'll talk about in a moment uh, when we get back into the library. And then also... Um, you know, other things related to the period. Again, we love it when people give us items. Uh, gifting to a nonprofit educational institution is a, a great legacy you can leave uh, to posterity because these items, if they're in private hands, can oftentimes be damaged or lost, uh, uh, you know, with all the best of intentions. And then also they're not available for scholars. So we have a, you know, part of our development efforts here are to get folks, connect with folks who have great collections of, of George Washington papers and manuscripts and try to bring them home to Mount Vernon. But we also are active with auctions, we're active with dealers and rare books and manuscripts, uh, and we're always trying to grow the collections in that sustainable way as we go forward. And I'll talk about some of the great acquisitions we've had as we go through the library a little bit. Well, including ones right here. So this is, um, this is indicative of one of the most important gifts that Mount Vernon has ever received. Uh, and really, we only finalized this gift in the last year um, that's from, from Richard H. Brown. Uh, and Richard is an extraordinary collector of maps and maps from the Revolutionary and French and Indian War era. So perfectly in the period of George Washington's military career. Uh, and it's an incredible collection of all the most important maps from that era, including many of which are manuscript maps, unknown maps, uh, you know, maps that were, were, there's only one copy of because it's in manuscript uh, and, and maps you can't see others of. So, for instance, uh, we have a number of maps that Lafayette had had made before he came to North America, still wrapped in the original linen, maps that were used in the field uh, during the American Revolution, some of the first uh, drawings of uh, the scene of battle. Uh, in New York, we have some incredible views, views of uh, Bunker Hill, uh, a week before the Battle of Bunker Hill. Um, beautiful watercolor. So explore the Richard Brown map collection on our webpage here at Mount Vernon uh, and, uh, and know that this is really a body of maps that are uh, as significant as any collection of Revolutionary War maps that exist. Uh, and also represents the, the bulk, in that, in that collection, you'll almost have an example of a map uh, that George Washington owned. He owned a massive collection of maps when he died. Most of those are now at Yale University. Um, but in Richard Brown's collection, you can see duplicate editions of pretty much every map that Washington uh, would have had, uh, in addition to maps that are one of a kind, like uh, uh, a manuscript map of, that the Marquis, Marquis of Chateauleau owned, so we'll talk about a little bit, which showed the approaches to, um, to Manhattan uh, during the Revolutionary War. So what do we have here? Today, what we brought out for you here is a particularly beautiful hand-colored uh, map uh, of the plan of the attack of Fort Sullivan near Charlestown, South Carolina, by a squadron of His Majesty's ships on the 28th of June, 1776. And it shows the disposition of the King's land forces, the encampments and the entrenchments of the rebels from the drawings made on the spot. And this was engraved by William Faden in London in 1776. So this is a great example of the news that uh, Londoners would have been getting about the scene of battle in North America during the American Revolutionary War. Now you all may know, so this was an effort by the British to take Charleston, which was the fourth largest city in North America at the time, and probably the second wealthiest city powered by the uh, rice trade, which is a crucial trade to, for the British at that time. Uh, and in this map, it really shows, what's so great about these 18th century battle maps is they, they show the scene of the action and they tell a narrative of the story of the battle itself. Now this battle didn't last that long 
And it was sort of a, you know, an effort early on in the war. So this is June 1776. This is about two weeks before the Declaration of Independence has been, has been uh, finalized in Philadelphia. Uh, so that hasn't happened yet. It's, you know, the, the war that's being fought is still the kind of rebellious colonies uh, versus the kings and the parliament's forces. Uh, uh, people aren't yet clear exactly what the stakes are. And, and in South Carolina, and, and the British for a long time believed the South of the Americas was a hotbed of loyalism, and that really all they needed to do was show up, and that the loyalists would rally to the king's cause. In reality, it didn't work out quite that way, and it wasn't until 1780, actually, uh, that the British were able to capture Charleston, and that way they had to do it with a really aggressive land siege overland after they'd already captured Savannah. So in this case, they kind of have this naive view that they can sort of just sail into the harbor. But the harbor of South Carolina is very complicated with lots of shoals, lots of short, uh, uh, you know, a lot, lot of uh, very little area for people who don't, aren't familiar with it, for ships, uh, seagoing vessels to be able to get close. And the uh, Patriots in, in South Carolina had built a fort named at the time Fort Sullivan. It's on Sullivan's Island, which is a great beach in Charleston if you ever go down there. Uh, Sullivan's Island fort and it was built with palmetto trees and and uh, palmettos you know got kind of little palm trees palmettos are very uh, soft wood uh, and, and the British thought actually that one you know one barrage of this battery uh, would destroy it that it looked like this motley you know collection of random trees and sand thrown up it didn't look like a very formidable battery battery itself and so they fired into it and then they couldn't understand why even when they had exploding canisters, exploding bombs that are intended to burn forts, it wouldn't catch fire because it was sand, basically. And also the palm, palmetto trees kind of absorbed the shock of the, uh, of, the, of, the, of the bombardment. So in fact, they would either bounce off or they would just embed into this soft uh, fort. And as the British came in closer, three of their ships got stuck on, on, uh, on, on small um, uh, shoals and couldn't get off for a long time. And also they had to kind of run around. There was an effort to create a, 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 a land bridge of, of vessels that would allow 2,000 troops to attack on the land side. And they were held off by provincial forces as well under barrage of musket fire. So it was a disastrous battle. Not 100 people lost their lives on the British side, only about 12 or so on the, on the Patriot side. So not incredibly bloody by modern standards. Uh, but devastating. The British lost one ship, uh, and it really put them off being able to, to take Charleston. A huge boost for, um, for a Patriot authority in Charleston and in South Carolina and in the South, which very quickly degenerated into the backcountry into really bitter civil war between the two factions of, of Loyalists and Patriot. Uh, and it would be very difficult for the British ever to really contain and control there. But it's a gorgeous map, as Matt has taken you through it there. Really special to see, uh, you know, the uh, the scale of the battle and that small little fort on Sullivan's Island. Ultimately, that fort becomes named Fort Moultrie after uh, General Moultrie, who was in command. William Moultrie goes on to become governor of South Carolina. He becomes a correspondent of George Washington. Uh, and of course, uh, well known. And the other thing about this battle is it shapes a lot of the early identity of the new Republic of South Carolina, ultimately. Uh, Carolina's flag is basically an homage to this battle. So the, that beautiful blue uh, flag represents the blue of the Patriots' uh, uniforms. Uh, the palmetto tree is featured right on the flag. And then the crescent moon, which was a symbol worn on the hats of the South Carolina regiment that fought in this battle. So that flag is, uh, you know, wouldn't exist without the successes at Sullivan's Island. And so it's really remarkable to think about, you know, where our symbols of community come from. Uh, and that becomes the representative flag of South Carolina. All right. Now we're going to go into a special place here. Now, I kept the door open for ease of access, but in fact, this is a secret room we're walking into here. This is the great manuscript room at Mount Vernon. Uh, and as Matt gets himself situated, he'll be able to come closer and you'll be able to get a sense of this. So this manuscript room, all around you see boxes, uh, you know, proper library manuscript boxes. Inside of these are letters from George Washington, or to George Washington from people all over the world. Also letters from Martha Washington 
Also letters uh, and the collection of Bushrod Washington's papers. He was a Supreme Court justice for over, uh, well, he died in 1829. We know when he died. And so he was a Supreme Court justice for over 30 years, actually, on the Marshall Court. Um, and so very important justice uh, himself uh, and an owner of Mount Vernon after uh, the passing of George Washington and Martha Washington. And, and so I brought out a selection, really, of some of the character of this contents, focusing on George and Martha Washington here. Uh, and I, you know, this is sort of a, uh, a great highlights tour of what we have in the vault here in, at the Mount Vernon Special Collection. And I'm gonna start with this piece right up front. Um, I see I'm walking a little out of screen here, but Matt's gonna pull it up for you. Uh, this is a survey and plat done by George Washington for James Hamilton to November 1749. Now you're doing the math in your head, I can see at home. 1749, done by George Washington in this survey, that means that he is what? He was born in 1732, so 1749, he's 17 years old here when he becomes the surveyor of Culpeper County. That's an official post. He got his certificate at the College of William and Mary to be a surveyor, encouraged by his brother, encouraged by his brother's uh, father-in-law, the Fairfaxes, Colonel William Fairfaxes, um, and encouraged by the Fairfaxes, uh, generally, and here he is as a 17-year-old man uh, with this official government post as a surveyor. He gets to earn money on this, and this is Culpeper County. This is what is basically the western part of Virginia at the time. And so he's surveying land that's going from wilderness land into these ordered pieces of property that are so crucial for the development of Virginia. Surveying is one of the professions that a gentleman could do in Virginia and still be considered a gentleman. It's uh, Obviously, there is labor involved in it, but it's not considered to be uh, a, a, a laboring profession or even a profession in trade. Surveying and the land is, is one of the most important, valuable things in Virginia, uh, and this is a crucial function of the governance of the province of Virginia going back into the 17th century. It's a beautiful survey. Uh, you know, surveys, a lot of the surveys that exist today are only the word portion, so the left side of your document there. But it's actually a description of the meets and bounds of a particular piece of property, you know, from this creek to this tree to this stone to that stone, measuring so many uh, uh, rods and, and, uh, and distances, uh, it, you know, represents the, uh, the property in words. And so many times these plats which accompany them don't, don't exist anymore. We're separated at some time. So this is an incredible uh, uh, survivor of Washington's early surveyorship, something from when he's 17 years old. And you also can see his signature here, where uh, Washington SCC says, Washington Surveyor Culpeper County. Uh, is how he signs this. And uh, I think he incorporates the George kind of into the loop-de-loops that are in the big W there. Uh, Washington himself, uh, you know, uh, is obsessed with his signature, I would submit to you. This is a beautiful example. Um, you know, this was an official document, so he would have taken his time to produce this. It's sort of a, a little a work of art. You know, his uh, cartouche on the map, which Matt will show you in a moment when he's done futzing around with stuff over there. Uh, yeah, see that little, uh, that, this little uh, compass dial he puts in there. This is all hand done by George Washington. Uh, here you have the 17-year-old Washington showing his his expertise showing off a little bit uh, with the quality of his workmanship here. Clearly proud of it. Now that signature is going to change. You know, and as we look at some of these other documents, you'll, you'll get to see what has become the more iconic George Washington signature. Uh, but you know, he's, he's a guy who would have sat down and wrote out his name until he found a signature that he really loved. And we see a real change in George Washington's signature from these early years into his mid-20s uh, as he's serving in the French and Indian War, he starts to develop something more and more like what we know is his. Now, the next item I want to uh, represent here, and then I'll take some questions about some of these items. But this is really um, one of the most important documents in our collection. It's priceless, absolutely uh, priceless. Uh, it was acquired by purchase in 1960, and it is one of three existing letters between George Washington and Martha Washington. Now you know that uh, Martha Washington likely destroyed their correspondence uh, in the flames uh, after he died or maybe before he died. 
Um, but in essence, that correspondence doesn't exist. We know they had one. Uh, it was written about by other people, uh, and it doesn't exist anymore, largely probably to protect the privacy of their relationship. This letter uh, was uh, discovered in a writing desk, which now exists in Mount Vernon in the bedroom, in the bedchamber, a women's writing desk. Uh, uh, and it was discovered behind a little drawer uh, in the 1840s, which makes it an incredible survivor. So this desk was obviously important and ended up getting pushed into one of these drawers and under the drawer and was discovered there. And you can see it suffered from kind of exposure over the years. So you have a better copy. Your digital version there is actually easier to read than the one I have in front of me. But it's an incredible letter. He writes it in June of 1775, uh, a little bit about a week or so after he becomes the commander in chief of the American army. So this is the, Con the Continental Congress uh, appointing George Washington commander in chief of this new army they've just taken over outside of Boston. So let's go back a little into our history lesson here. So remember the shots heard around the world, right? April of 1775 at Lexington and Concord. And so as General Gage uh, es escapes and, and retreats back into Boston, he gets surrounded by about 20,000 militiamen from all over uh, New England, but mostly Massachusetts, who descend on Boston and basically are encamped in this sort of ad hoc siege of the British outside Boston. That's the beginning of the fighting part of the protest against parliamentary taxes, the protest against the Intolerable Act. So this is the beginning of the American Revolutionary War. Congress, the Continental Congress, uh, you know, th this happens while they're, while they're coming together. So Washington actually learns about it when he arrives in Philadelphia. And that Continental Congress then is asked to take over this army. Um, and the idea is that this is a cause of all of America. It's not just a cause of the people of Boston. And the Continental Congress agrees to do that. And they take over this Continental Army. It's really the first act of the creation of an American government. Because the Continental Congress before this army is just kind of like a debating society that's sending out resolutions against Parliament. They're, yeah, they're communicating and maybe coordinating their protests, but they're not a government in any real sense. All of a sudden, once you take over an army, you become a government. Uh, because now they got to raise money to pay for that. they got to regulate the army. And with the appointment of George Washington as the commander-in-chief of that army, it's the creation of the United States of America as, as a new entity, a new power in the world. Now, whether that power would survive or not, of course, had a lot to do with what would happen. So Washington writes this uh, basically to Martha saying, you know, that he, he's uh, – you know, he's going, he's, he's on his way to Boston. He writes this letter. He's surrounded by people in Philadelphia. He doesn't have a lot of time to write. He says, I'm here with other people. I don't have time to write, but I retain for you an unalterable affection, which neither time nor distance can change. I mean, you know, that's pretty good stuff. He couldn't just go out to a Hallmark store, you know, find some, some little letter. He just whips that out. I retain for you an unalterable affection, which neither time nor distance can change. Really powerful. He goes on to say, you know, he, he hopes to see her, uh, you know, in the in the winter time, and he goes on to say, you know, uh, I he signs it sincerely, yours entire, George Washington, and it starts out, my dearest, doesn't say dear Martha or dear Patsy, she often called her, it says my dearest, he signs it, yours entire, George Washington. It's really a powerful letter. The sentiment is in there. It's rich. It's real. It's authentic, uh, and it's really irreplaceable and remarkable insight into their very difficult relationship to get your head into. So, I mean, he's right up about to go off and become a rebel. He's going to war, and if he loses, he'll be executed. I mean, this is what do the British do uh, to rebels in the 18th century? What happens to Scotland after the Battle of Culloden? All the people that rose for Bonnie Prince Charlie, all the Scots get executed or sent overseas. Washington's property, everything he ever had is, is at, at risk. He's about to take up arms against his king. This is a re really powerful letter uh, for a lot of reasons, and we're really lucky to have it here at Mount Vernon. The questions. Doug, there is a lot of questions about uh, the quality of George Washington's handwriting. Yes. He's got beautiful handwriting, and handwriting was an important way to show that you were actually a learned person. Uh, if someone didn't know how to write, they didn't know how to behave. It was a sign of literacy, which not everybody had. So in Virginia in particular, New England society was a very literate society. 
uh, and had been for a long time. But we always distinguish in literacy between writing and reading. Uh, when we think about, you know, uh, writing is actually harder than reading, right? So writing is the next stage of literacy. And then writing beautifully, of course, uh, puts you into the ranks of the educated. And George Washington, who had no formal education, but yet always had to project that he was a gentleman, a proper gentleman who knew how to, how to do things correctly. Uh, one way to show that is in your correspondence. So he's very careful with his correspondence. He develops over the course of his lifetime, I think, a beautiful uh, writing ability from the quantity he's doing it. Uh, you know, he really, he really develops into a great writer uh, through all the correspondence he does. In fact, that's one of the things that Thomas Jefferson writes about Washington in an interesting uh, uh, survey of his character that he does in the 18 teens, in which he does mention how Washington didn't have a lot of conversation on other subjects, that he had limited formal education, but that he was a beautiful letter writer. And he wasn't just talking about that, the penmanship. So the penmanship is important though. And Washington, what he would do was he would, he would, uh, he would write out a scratched piece of paper or, or, or actually, and he describes this when he, so he, when he receives a letter, he would read it and keep notes. So he would break up the letter into the parts that he has to respond to. And then he would take those notes of responses and, and compose his own draft letter. And then usually then he would compose another fair letter that he would actually send. So in, in many cases, he had a letter book where these draft letters exist. A lot of the letters of the Library of Congress are from his letter books, as well as, as because the final ones were sent out to other people. And so in some cases, we are collecting letters uh, that, that were sent to other people. And, and these are uh, two examples in front of me I want to talk about next. So I'll go ahead and get to that. Um, so these are letters that were received by uh, a man by the name of Francois Jean, the Marquis de Chapelou or as Washington knew him, the Chevalier de Chateau, Major General Chateau, who was on the staff of Rochambeau's army. He is a man who is one of the great heroes of the American Revolution, completely forgotten today. When people think about the French in the American Revolution, they think about Lafayette. And Lafayette is incredible and important in many, many ways. Lafayette, of course, didn't serve in the French army during the American Revolution. He served in the American army. So he was a Frenchman, of course, who came over to the American to fight in the American cause at the age of 19 and was a remarkable person uh, and became a great friend of George Washington's. But Washington considered him as an adoptive son in many cases, as, as Lafayette would often call himself. I am your adopted son. I am your I am your son. You are my father. You're my general. I'm your aide de camp. Chateau served with Rochambeau in Rochambeau's army, the Expeditionary Army that comes over to try to move the American Revolution forward. Uh, Chateau is an extraordinary figure in his own right. Uh, he was a philosopher. He wrote books. Uh, he, he was of a noble family, related to Lafayette, actually, uh, through their wives. Um, but Chateau uh, was a man of, of much greater substance in French society than Lafayette. Um, he himself uh, was raised in arms like Washington. Uh, he fought in the... Uh, the Seven Years' War, the Battle of Minden. Uh, he, he was uh, a, a colonel at the age of 19, like Washington was. And crucially, when he gets to the American Revolution, he's only two years younger than George Washington. So they're peers. He's a major general in the French army. He's a great man in his own right. So Washington and he are equals. I mean, clearly Washington is the commander in chief. And so there's a difference in rank. But in terms of their, uh, their circumstance, at the head of uh, their, their worlds, uh, they are equal. And Chateau uh, is an incredible figure. He, he, so he travels around with George Washington quite a bit because he's on Rochambeau's staff. And he's also, as a philosopher, he's very interested in this American world. He's really one of the first uh, Frenchmen uh, that's going to try to describe America to a European audience. And so he goes on to write his travels of Chateau, uh, a collection of his journals from the Revolutionary War period. So he's here roughly from 1780 to 1782. And George Washington has a tremendous uh, uh, correspondence with him, a correspondence that is unique in its personal character. Now, George Washington is always holding us at arm's length, right? He, he is very private, and he doesn't want people to really get at the inner George. Uh, he's not like John Adams, who's just going to pour out all of his emotions on the page, you know, which makes John Adams so much fun to read and makes Washington sometimes seem boring. And so the correspondence with Chateau is so important because it shows him really writing to his best friend 
writing to someone that he trusts, writing to someone that you know he's not really going to be in command of, uh, writing to someone that he can share his his sentiments, his feelings, his humor, uh, his fears, his hopes, uh, in a way that we don't really often think about Washington. So I brought out two letters here, uh, which are indicative. We own six. There's about 20, I think, or so, maybe 15 or so, that exist between George Washington and Chateau. And what's remarkable about these is that they uh, were the ones that Chateau actually read in France. Uh, and they are ones that only recently were known to exist. Uh, the papers of uh, François Jean de Châtelieu were thought destroyed, but they actually are still held by the Châtelieu family today in Burgundy, in France. And I actually had the great honor of being with the Châtelieu family last September uh, to look at the actual manuscripts. Now, they've sold some of these uh, at market, and that's how we discovered them uh, when they came up for auction at Christie's. And again, this is how we, we buy things when they come up. And in this case, they were so important. And so, why are they important? I mentioned already why, but let me. When I say when I say Chateau is George Washington's best friend, you say what? I've never heard of this guy. Well, let me prove it to you with this letter right here. Um, 14 December 1782, George Washington to Francois Jean de Beauvier, uh, Marquis de Chateau. Uh, now, Chateau. For those French readers and speakers out there, you might be saying, "What is this name, Chateau?" This is how the family today pr pronounces their name, Chateau, even though it looks like Chastelux. Uh, there's an S, there's an X at the end, but Chateau, I promise you, is the way it should be pronounced. Okay, so it, this is a great letter because uh, Chateau is going back to France after the American Revolution is almost over. It's 1782 in December. So we're still really a year before the final treaty arrives in North America. But the major battles are over. They've won Yorktown. Chateau was at Yorktown. Um, and Washington is saying goodbye to him uh, at the dock. And Washington doesn't say anything when they depart. And he writes this letter, actually. I'm going to flip it over here real quick when you can't, you won't have this on to see. But he basically says, I felt too much to express anything the day I parted with you. I felt too much to express anything the day I parted with you. A sense of your public services to this country and gratitude for your private friendship quite overcame me at the moment of, of, uh, of, your, uh, of your leaving. So that's an incredible sense of Washington is, he's proclaimed. You know, he can't speak. He's so emotional when Chateau is leaving. But, but I should be wanting to the feelings of my heart and should do violence to my inclination. Was I to suffer you to leave this country without the warmest assurances of affection for you, your person and character? So this is to make up for the fact they didn't say anything when they parted. And he goes on to say... <clears throat> For the impressions of esteem, which opportunities and your benevolence of mind has since improved into, this is wonderful, a deep and lasting friendship. So we have a deep and lasting friendship, a friendship which neither time nor distance can ever eradicate. That might sound familiar. It's almost the same line he uses on Martha, in which he says we have a, a affection which neither time nor distance can change. This is a friendship which neither time nor distance can eradicate. I mean, when you've got a good line, you use it again and again. And Washington uses his great line. He goes back into the vault, pulls out this great line, whips it on Chateau. Unbelievable. And then he says, this is the powerful line. This is the hashtag line to put on the shirt. And he says, I can truly say that never in my life did I part with a man for whom my soul clave more sincerely than it did for you. Soul clave. My soul clave more sincerely than it did for you. This is his soulmate. Chateau is Washington's best friend, his dear, dear friend, and he's emotional at their parting. He knows the, mag ma the magnitude of what this man had done for his country. He knows the personal friendship, uh, you, you know, the intimacy that they'd seen together. They'd seen the lines. They'd been in Washington's marquee tent together. Uh, they dined together. And Chateau has a great description of their first meeting in, the, in, in his uh, voyage of Chateau, which you can find online as well. So another letter of, that Washington writes to Chateau I have here in front of me, and you can see how beautiful the hand is in these and how pristine these are, how crisp they are. 
But this is written from Mount Vernon in February 1784. So Washington's only been home for about a month and a few days because he arrives back to Mount Vernon after giving up his, his commission and returning his commission to Congress in, in December of, in Annapolis in 1783. Gets back to Mount Vernon Christmas Eve. They get snowed in. Basically, he hasn't done much. And he's writing this letter in early February. And he says, I am at last become a private citizen on the banks of the Potomac, where under my own vine and my own fig tree, free from the bustle of a camp and from the intrigues of a court, I shall view the busy world with a calm indifference and with that sincerity of mind uh, which the soldier in pursuit of glory and the statesman of a name have uh, not uh, leisure to enjoy. Incredible sentiment. This is Washington writing beautifully uh, to Chatelieu in this case. And he uses his, that age old phrase, the vine and fig tree phrase, which, you know, you know, the song from Hamilton at the end of the farewell address, Washington uses the vine and fig tree phrase almost 30 times or so in his correspondence and expressing to Chatelieu that, uh, that great desire to spend the rest of his days away from politics and intrigue. And of course, we know that he'll be drew, drew back into it. But the letters of Chateauneuf are worth exploring on our webpage. I mean, in them, you will see George Washington make a joke, uh, probably one of the few jokes that you'll find in his correspondence after he finds out that Chateauneuf gets married. He says, a wife, a wife, my dear Marquis, I see you are caught at last. And he says, you know, a wife uh, like the smallpox or the plague is something you can only have once in your life, uh, which, you know, is a funny line. You know, it's the classic wife joke of the vaudevillian kind, and here's George Washington, again, revealing that comfort and intimacy that he has uh, with Chateauneuf. He also uh, talks again about the danger of war in Europe. He talks in some of these letters about his hope for universal trade between Europe and the Americas so that, uh, that everyone will make war no more and that commerce would uh, make everyone see themselves as people who share the earth, as, as common, uh, common uh, children of, of one parent. And so Washington gets a little bit uh, philosophical in these letters of Chantelieu, and you should definitely take a look at them on our webpage. Now, finally, I brought out what I think is one of the most important items we have in our collection, and this is a list, uh, as it says on the top, Negroes belonging to George Washington in his own right and by marriage. This is a list of all the enslaved people that lived at Mount Vernon that were owned by George Washington and by the Custis estate in 1799. So why is George Washington creating this list? Obviously, it's good plantation management to understand where your resources are. But this is a unique document because Washington is really trying to de uh, designate the difference between slaves that he owns, that they're his property, and slaves that are owned as a dower right of Martha through the Custis estate. So I've talked about this many times in the past, but when Martha uh, is widowed, uh, when she's 26 years old, before she marries George Washington, she gets a dower right to a portion of the slaves of, of her former husband, in this case, uh, the Custis, Mr. Custis. And, that's, and, and those slaves come with her to Mount Vernon. Now that, you know, that happens. She comes to Mount Vernon in the 1750s, right? So 1759, 40 years before Washington is creating this document. And what has happened since 1759 is that that population of enslaved people has grown. They've intermarried with people that have been, uh, that were George Washington's. And by the law in Virginia, um, the ownership goes by uh, the mother. So if the mother, uh, an enslaved woman uh, was owned by Martha, those children would be owned by the Custis family. If the enslaved woman was George Washington, the children of that would be George Washington's property. Uh, by, the, by the laws of Virginia. And so this accounting of, of all these names and, their, and, their, uh, and really their families is a way that Washington was trying to figure out, uh, this is really the process of creating his will, where he's going to free the slaves that he owns uh, outright. He cannot free the ones that are owned by Martha and are owned by uh, the Custis family. And so this is an essential document in trying to figure out in, in his own right uh, where his property stands so that he can uh, so he can prepare his, his last will and testament, uh, which he does, um, we believe, in the summer of 1799, which th this is um, dated from July of 1799. It, it also is a remarkable document in that there's so little um, detailed information about enslaved people in the 18th century. Uh, and in this case, this is in the hand of George Washington. It's attested 
to by him. It shows ages, it has names, it has connections. It's a remarkable document that gives some life to these people that are lost in many cases to history because they don't have the formal uh, documentation of, of free people. You don't have the county court records with their, you, know, you don't have baptismal records from churches. You don't have their appearances in county courts. You don't have, uh, you don't have that sort of marriage documents. You don't have the social history documents that help us um, connect the dots on who people were and how they lived. So it's a very important document for many, many reasons. Uh, and, um, and it is one of the, uh, the the really priceless aspects of the collection here at Mount Vernon. Uh, questions, Matt, about some of the items I've talked about or yeah, uh, we, our we, collection? We had a question um, from Jay who would like to know, you know, talk a little bit about the building and how we're protecting these documents from disaster and whatnot. Yeah, so we are in the, uh, the, the suite here, um, the rare books and manuscripts suite, which is kept at the appropriate temperature and the appropriate humidity level uh, with the pollutants being uh, regularly taken out of the air through our filtering system. So that the highest standards of conservation of these materials, which we want to last forever. And this inner core of the building is surrounded by a, a building, which also of course has its atmosphere control, but we have a door, for instance, on, on this suite, which can withstand a five hour fire. Uh, we have all the, uh, uh, the latest, greatest tech uh, to, to enhance the security here, which I won't talk too much about, but in essence to say that this is a secure uh, place where, where, uh, where these materials can be for a long, long time. And uh, Esther would like to know uh, what kind of books are there, uh, you know, um, and what kind of books did Washington have? And what yes, kind of great question about the books. So that's the last uh, third of our program, which we're running out of time for you, but I'm going on and on as usual. Um, uh, and, and the first book is actually right here indicative. It's, it's nice because you can see George Washington's book plate. It has an original book plate of George Washington in it. Now, books in the 18th century are valuable things. You know, they're expensive. They're hard to get. And so people who own books often put their book plate in to show their ownership of this item. Washington designed this book plate, or at least he designed it in words when he wrote to a, uh, a printer in London in 1772. It has the Washington family crest on it, uh, as well as um, the motto Exodus Act of Probat. It, it doesn't have the griffin. It has the double piece on top of it, which, of course, is important to George Washington as a man of peace. Uh, he put the, the double piece on the mansion house, and it shows ownership. Now, this book is a copy of Don Quixote, uh, Cervantes' Don Quixote. And those of you may may not know, George Washington owned two copies of Don Quixote's, uh, or, or Cervantes' great Don Quixote. One is in English. This is Tobias Lear's 1786 London version, four volumes. And the incredible thing about this book is that George Washington purchased it September 17, 1787. Why does that date matter? Of course, nobody ever asked me this on the Trivia Thursdays, but September 17, 1787 is the day that George Washington signed the U.S. Constitution. He also went out and bought a copy of Don Quixote. That copy is right here in front of you. It's right here. We own it. So why did he do this? So, in fact, he has two editions of Don Quixote in, uh, in his library, and I'll show you some of those in a minute. But... Um, uh, but uh, the reason he bought it, I mean, is essentially that... Uh, we know why, because a, a few months later at Mount Vernon, he receives this beautiful Madrid Spanish language edition from 1780, sent to him by the Spanish ambassador, uh, who says, Your Excellency, I remember when we were together at uh, Dr. Franklin's house in Philadelphia, you mentioned you didn't know the great Cervantes. So I enclosed for you the finest edition ever made of all the perfect materials, all from Spain. I only wish it was in English so you could enjoy it. And so it speaks a lot to Washington that here he was at a dinner party with Ben Franklin. Uh, he didn't know about uh, Cervantes that comes up in conversation. Washington is a self-educated man. You find yourselves in these positions you can do, you know, we've all been at dinner parties where somebody starts talking about a TV show or a person or a book, uh, and they're talking about it as if only an idiot wouldn't know about it. And you can do one of two things. You can sort of bluff your way through, right? And say, like, oh, yeah, good book. I read that. <clears throat> or or you do what George Washington does. You cannot tell a lie. He admits he doesn't know Cervantes, and, and yet he also addresses that absence. 
and he goes out and buys a copy of Cervantes. You can imagine Ben Franklin, Dr. Franklin saying, well, you know, General, uh, there's a new edition by Smollett down at such and such a bookshop in Philadelphia, and Washington buys that on the day he's leaving town to go back to Mount Vernon. And that's the book right there. So it talks, uh, again, a, a, a small little story, but a big way to understand George Washington, the reader, a lifelong curious reader, uh, a lifelong learner. And let's take a look at his special collection of books we have back here in the vault. we we'll take you into the inner sanctum. Let there be light. So here we are in the vault in Mount Vernon, the Holy Holies, the center of the library, the center of Washington's mind. He put together his own education. He's an autodidact like Ben Franklin, uh, self-educated, uh, builds a library over a lifetime. Now, when he died in Mount Vernon, in the study, there were about 900 volumes, about 1,300 titles in his library. And these have been collected over a lifetime. In this room, there's about 700 odd volumes, uh, 102, 103 or so of which from these encyclopedias down to here. These are our books that were owned by George Washington here at Mount Vernon that have come back to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Uh, incredible collection. These are books that he would have had in his hand. He wrote in some of them, he read these. The rest of the books in this vault are duplicate editions, which means they're the same edition of a book that we know he owned, we're not, they're not the actual book that was here, right? So they're a duplicate, which is a great way to represent his library and his education. Uh, and so all the different subjects, you know, he he uh, he has reading writing and arithmetic when his father dies. Uh, he gets some early books on religion from his mother. Uh, he starts buying books on, on geography and, uh, and history, and he's a surveyor. You know, he's, he's building books that he needs to do his work. When he becomes a military figure, he starts acquiring books on, on military, um, on design, on the latest military science. Uh, he starts becoming involved as a planter and an agriculturalist. He starts expanding his agricultural list. In fact, he has a great collection of the latest, greatest agricultural work from the late 18th century. And he becomes a correspondent with you know, um, uh, reformers, agricultural reformers throughout the world. In, in his lifetime, is known as one of the great farmers of his age. Uh, and it's always learning through doing experimentation and reading that he becomes a great, a great farmer. And that's what you see with him, that he encourages reading as a way to learn, uh, not only doing, but, but reading. And, and he encourages this in his officer corps. Uh, and it, he eventually acquires a lot of bell letters. So, so like the story about Don Quixote, he's getting the latest uh, fiction of the age. He gets sent a lot of books as well, some of which no doubt he never reads. You know, we all get sent things and we don't read. Some of those are no doubt in this collection as well. So it's a, it's a human library, uh, but it's a great library for its age. I mean, 18th century libraries in Virginia tend to be small. Jefferson had one of the largest of them, which became the core of the collection of the Library of Congress, of course, when he sold it after the War of 1812. Um, that library was about 6,000 volumes. Washington was about 900 when he died. So substantial library. Um, and, you know, and Washington didn't have a lot in, in non-English languages. He only read in English. He does have a few notable French items. The, uh, the Chatelieu's uh, voyages are an original in French, which was sent to him by Marquis de Chatelieu. Also, I love the uh, English language, Chancellor of Voyages, which he also has here, because I submit to you that book, and I, but someday we'll, we'll, we'll pull it out for you to take a look at, but I think his big thumbprints are in that book. There's these giant thumbprints in, that, uh, in the Chancellor book. It looks like someone held it out open with two hands uh, all throughout, where you can see the discoloration in the pages where two big thumbs would be, and I think I know who those thumbs were. All right, so... Here we are in this great vault. This is an artistic rendering of his book plate. Obviously, even Washington didn't have a book this large. We have a question about his book plate. So yeah. why are the, what's the significance of the three stars? So this, this is the Washington book plate. The three stars are part of the Washington family crest, uh, the coat of arms that was given to the Washington family. Uh, they earned it after the Battle of Cressy, actually, in the Hundred Years' War. So Battle of Cressy, uh, a Washington descendant had been involved in a dragoon fight, uh, and these are spurs. They represent spurs of the dragoons 
and the, the bars are red, uh, represent rivers of blood and spurs. So a very martial attitude to that original crest as well. Um, the other thing notable about this is Exodus Acta Probat, which in Latin uh, can be translated a number of ways. Um, it, it can be translated as the ends justify the means, but it also can be translated as uh, the result is the test of the action. Uh, and I think that Washington really uh, used and, 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 and thought about action speaking louder than words. In fact, he often he wrote to his overseer, James Anderson, at the end of his life, in which he said, I've always made it a habit to make um, my deeds uh, rather than my writings show um, what, uh, what was important. And, I, and Washington really presents himself that way to us, that he, he lived a, an active life, and it's our job really to understand it. He doesn't write an autobiography like Ben Franklin, which is you know half made up. He doesn't write a series of letters in his old age like John Adams complaining about how the history books are treating him, you know, rewriting things, justifying things. Washington says, this is the life I've lived, and it's your job to, uh, to understand it. And that's really our job here at Mount Vernon at the Washington Library. And so I think we're inspired in this center uh, library by those words. Uh, and and how, how can we get at and make meaningful the great life that he lived uh, that we all have benefited from so much? Uh, any, any questions here, Matt, as we, as we wind down? We do. We have a few questions, but uh, we're running low on time, too. The, the question, uh, Doug, about the personal correspondence, did, did Washington read all the correspondence? Did he have someone read these for him? Yeah, so Washington's personal correspondence, there's kind of two areas. Most of Washington's correspondence would have been read by him. There's two periods, one, one period in particular, where you know he had a lot of help, and that's during the American Revolutionary War, where a lot of the correspondence is dealing with the operations of the war. And he had his aides de camp, like Hamilton, like Lawrence, like others, um, Talmadge, I mean, all these others who were there and aided him, uh, you know, in often drafting uh, responses. Uh, in many cases, he would have been composing these. In many cases, they would have been composed by the aide, and he would have just signed them and approved them. And so that's more of a, you know, that's more of an official uh, correspondence in which you are working with a staff to maintain the flow of information and command. Uh, you know, he does a little bit of that with his private secretaries uh, in the presidency as well in which they're helping manage the, the flow of information, that he's sometimes taking things and sending them out to different department heads. Um, you know, so again, there's the professional correspondence versus personal. In the personal case, yes, he's reading everything. I mean, the correspondence are legal documents. I mean, they're very important. Um, you know, the contracts that he's entered into uh, are negotiated and, 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 and seen within these documents. So they, it's very important for for men of business to keep their correspondence, to keep it clear, to keep it organized. And Washington was a meticulous type A figure. And, and so the correspondence is really important. And Doug, we have a question from Adam. He's uh, very familiar with the Acts of Congress where Washington puts his note notes in the margins. Do you see that in other books? Yeah, is Washington writing a lot of books? You know, typically not. He does tend to correct typos in his book. Uh, you know, in fact, there's a great uh, one of ours, which is a, a book on navigation. It's about how to uh, and how to do the declensions of the sun. And he actually corrects the mathematical formulas in that book because they, they they transpose from the, the, the chart that you're supposed to use into the formula. They do it incorrectly in the example in the book itself. And Washington changes it and shows it in the correct way. So that's kind of remarkable when you think about it. Now, but also, there, you know, there's there's one famous uh, pamphlet where Washington does kind of annotate it in a running argument against the arguments of the pamphlet. That was the pamphlet written by James Monroe uh, about his time in France during the French Revolution when he was representing the United States uh, and, and uh, to the, the directory, the French government at the time, and doing it in such a way that he had to come back and defend his behavior. And it was an embarrassment to Washington because Washington had appointed Monroe to this position, but Monroe was a Republican, not a Federalist, Jeffersonian Republican. And so he behaved badly. Uh, uh, he wrote this defense of his work, and Washington writes in the margin, attacking, attacking Monroe uh, in the margins of that book. It's owned by Harvard's uh, Outland Library, 
and it is really one of the uh, the coolest things ever. Because again, Washington doesn't do that kind of thing. He kept notes. He kept separate little books of notes for a lot of his agriculture books. He would bring those out in the field with him, and and, he, and he, I think he took notes from a lot of things. A lot of these exist in the Library of Congress. We own a few, but he was an active reader. Doug, probably have time for one more question from Cynthia. She would like to know, are there any books that you would like to see return to the collection here? Wow. So what books would I like to see return to the collection here? Well, I'd like to see them all return to the collection here at Mount Vernon. Um, that won't happen. The, many of them are safe and sound in important, great places, great libraries. Boston Athenaeum has a great collection, about 300 volumes of Washington's original library including books on military science, including his original copy of Common Sense, which is an incredible, difficult book to even find a duplicate edition of the first editions of Common Sense. I think there's only something like five or six known uh, in the world. So uh, they had Washington's, uh, the, the, the story about how they ended up in the Boston Athenaeum was really cool. The British Library at the time was expanding their Americana section and were offered this collection of books of George Washington's um, to purchase, and the people of Boston were so outraged that, this, that Washington's library was going to go to Britain that they raised the money to purchase these books, they put them in the Boston Athenaeum, and there they are today, uh, safe and sound. So uh, thank God for, for the people of Boston to save that legacy for us. But in fact, there are many of George Washington's books. There's two at the National Library of Scotland. There's books at the Huntington Library. There's books in, in, in Newbury. I think I, I want the books that are in private hands to come back to Mount Vernon. Uh, most particularly, uh, you know, and there are some good ones out there. Uh, so uh, keep your eyes peeled. We'll hopefully have some uh, acquisitions over the next few years and, and maybe sooner as we build up uh, our collection here as the, the ultimate repository of the papers and legacy of George Washington here at the Washington Library. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, I've really enjoyed it. I mean, I, I could go on and on, as you know, uh, with the collections here. Maybe we'll do another one with a different selection of papers at some point and look at this from a different angle of view. Um, but I think reading in the correspondence of George Washington is, is always a, uh, an enlightening experience. So thank you for being with us here today. I uh, very much appreciate your ongoing support from Mount Vernon. Spread the word. Uh, like these videos. Subscribe to our feeds. Share them with your friends. And let's build an army of missionaries for the mission of the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Uh, signing off, Doug Bradburn from the Washington Library.